I'm gonna roll all over your butt. Roll all over your butt. All right, I'm rolling. All over your butt? <laughs> uh, n- no. <laughs> Hoopa cast. Hello, Dustin. Hello, Hoopa. How are you? I'm good. Sweet. How you be? I'm good, man. I didn't get to see you last week. Oh, I know. Well, you sort of did. Well, yeah, but like in a weird, like... The listeners didn't know. Yeah, they did. Even though I expressly explained to them. (laughs) Yeah, I was going to say, you you, you were pretty explicit about what was happening here. Yeah. Um, Yes, last week, um, if you skipped the intro for some reason... You missed me explaining that last week's episode was what we refer to in the news as a look live. Um, it appears, uh, you know, n- the news, there's a live shot. There's a person out somewhere, and they've remoted back to us, and then they talk for a little bit, and then they toss to their uh, their story, and then we play their story, right? Um, but then sometimes if, like, they need to come back to the station, but we still got to air the story later, sometimes you do a straight package, sometimes you do a look live. And that's basically where they pre-record their intro and outs, they slap it on at the beginning and the end of the timeline, and then you play it as if they're live. Look live. It looks like they're live. So um, there's a little lesson for you guys today. So that's basically what we did uh, last week, and I personally think it turned out great, but, um, you know. Yeah, I enjoyed it. I also think that I'm, you know. Biased. Well, I was going to say, like, um, uh, unfairly handsome, but. I was going to say biased. Oh, well. In your opinions towards this particular podcast. I was going more toward my looks. I was trying to steer it back towards me. Um, you narcissistic son of a gun. Oh, yes. All right. So, um, yeah, we did that last week. So um, that's that will happen anytime Dustin and I cannot meet up. Uh, well, meet up um, every single week. Um, every single year. <laughs> they don't know that. Um, anytime Dustin and I cannot, uh, get together and do this, um, live-ish, like now, mm-hmm. um, we're gonna throw together a prereq for you, but it will be the, it'll be about 80% the same content. Uh, yeah. just not things like this, like, Dustin, what's your favorite color? Blue. Oh, cool. Hey, guess what would happen if this was a prereq? Hey, Dustin, what's your favorite color? And, uh, here, you, you do it to me, Dustin. Uh, you asked me the question. Like, like this is a prereq. Ask me, you know, try to improv with, with someone who's not there. Go. Hooper, what were your thoughts on the, on the, just the general th- uh, the stuff of movies? <coughs> testing, testing, testing. Okay, here we go. Wow, insightful, Hooper. So I, I thought that maybe the keyboard would be, um, I don't want to say black and white, but maybe white and black. Um, <coughs> yeah, something like that. Such a great opinion. Yeah. <laughs> it, it basically feels like one of those kids shows where it's like, how do we get to Blue Mountain? Very good. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, my daughters are home like, the <laughs> Door's like, correct. Like, no, she wasn't. <laughs> You weren't listening. <laughs> okay, anyway, sorry, everybody. We, we digress. Um, yeah. So uh, we're going to talk some TV, or rather I'm going to pontificate a little bit about TV. I imagine Dustin has some supporting thoughts on these two shows that he doesn't watch. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, I want to talk first about Game of Thrones. Um, this past Sunday, um, both Game of Thrones and Silicon Valley aired their C- uh, season finales on HBO. Game of Thrones was the season five finale, and Silicon Valley was the um, season two finale. So I want to talk about Game of Thrones real quick. Um, I, uh, I, I, I I don't think I watched the show from the beginning, but I think I picked it up fairly earlier than I do most shows that I'm now into. Um, mm-hmm. So the Game of Thrones um, is, uh, you know, based on the book series. You all know what Game of Thrones is. I don't have to explain what it is. Um, what is it, Hooper? Oh, well, go look it up. Anyway, um... <laughs> Can you imagine the cartoons doing that? Like, where? Why don't you Google it? We're moving on. <laughs> um, you stupid idiot. Yeah, keep up, kids. What are the, you, the, four? The slow bus is that way. 
for some reason surrounding this season, there's been more a lot of controversy. Yeah, like there's been a lot of social media outcry against this this season for some reason. Um, and uh, I've 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 stewed about it for weeks before we even got to this topic today. So mm-hmm. you're not going to get my full wrath about the topic. I feel like I've sort of um, spent on it, but sure. um, essentially things like a rape happening, um, which is uh, which I have now na- time and again described as, in my opinion, the most benign and implied off screen, by the way, rape of a character in any storytelling I've ever um, had story told to, to me. <laughs> um, you we know, are, that, we that, are so good with words th- today. that I've experienced. Like it, it was very benign. And then, mm. like senator, or some I can't remember which senator. Who cares? Um, came out and was like, "Ah, that was in very poor taste." Um, I'm done with Game of Thrones. And just mm. people announcing every week that like they're gonna that now they're gonna stop watching the show because they've crossed. I mean, and then um, uh, the episode after that. Um, one of the characters like burned his daughter at the stake and they're like, Oh, they've killed children. I'm, I'm out. And then mm-hmm. it's like, you have to remember the context of the show. Well, f- for me, my first reaction is all right, go like g- God, just go. David Benioff and DB Weiss are not mourning the loss of your viewership. Their show is insanely popular. Your outrage about it gives them free press. First of, and for me, it's just like, if you've hung in for five seasons, why don't you just, you know, you can take a break, I guess, but, I, I, I don't. It, a certain, when I'm this far into the show, unless I'm incredibly, incredibly offended by the content, which never happens, I'm not going to put it down and never come back to it. It just yeah, seems, and, and you'd be more likely offended by like the artistic. Yeah, like, I'd be offended by the like the story not, falling completely apart. You know, right, rather right, than the exactly. actions. By the way, the actions of evil characters who are fictional. Santa Claus didn't rape Rudolph. Yeah, I don't think. I, not that I know of. Not that I'm aware. I of hope either. not. That would that'd be an eye That opener. would ruin Christmas. Yeah, that, would, that would certainly ruin Christmas. It'd be a sad Christmas. Yeah, for starters. You know, this was an evil man raping a good character. And I've read blogs and stuff that talk about how it contributes to the moral decline of the culture, but that's that's a whole different argument. My short answer is n- no, it doesn't. Shut up. My thing mostly is this show is set in. It's fictional, but it's set in what you would compare to, like, you know, kind of medieval times. Like, a, a very terrible time to live um, yeah. for everybody. And um, the show, to me, is about suffering. You know, and, I mean, it's not principally about suffering, but it's it, it, it involves human suffering. And I, I don't think it's at all exploitative. Anytime someone gets their head cut off in combat, I, to, I'm, to me, it's not at all out of place. Amidst all the controversy, I I really did think that this was their strongest season finale that they've had, and probably their strongest season. I mean, this is a show that that has some cool stuff happening, but especially in the first couple of seasons, it's fairly slow because there's so much establishing, so much setup. I mean, imagine any TV show, Dustin, like where there's there's a whole lot of setup that you really have to kind of pay attention to, and then there's a little bit of payoff mid season, and of course toward the end of the whole show, um, yeah. but. This is a show where people are talking about fictional places, and there's a lot of names to remember. And, you know, there's no cell phones. There's, no, there, there, there's just stuff in it. that it's, it's a tall order to actually get people to hang on. And mm-hmm. I would argue that they actually – they could have dipped to the low-hanging fruit and had a lot more needless action scenes in the show um, to grab people's viewership early. So I'm actually impressed that they didn't do that. Because people will think when when people who don't watch Game of Thrones, if if they idealize it without having seen it, they're thinking, "Oh, there's battles every episode." It's like, no, it's mostly just talking and traveling, just a lot mm-hmm. of talking and traveling. So, it's actually impressive to to have for a show to be this popular this far into their series um, without having to pander to the expectations of people who maybe want to see more sword fights. Um, I just think that it was uh, the best season of all of them because now there's finally payoff. There's characters who've never met before in the show who are finally in the same place and talking to each other. Um, there are a lot of things that are set up that are paying off. There's um, The most interesting thing to me is um, I think they're at the point now in the show where they have caught up to where the books are. And George R. R. Martin hasn't written any books and like hasn't added to the series in like 20 years or something like that. Um, and so everyone was wondering, what are they going to do when um, 
you know, when they catch up to the books and it's like, well, what do you think? Well, they're going to, they're not going to stop their show. What do you think they're going to do? They're going to, they're going to write it. Um, that's actually good to me because I'm in this, this is a similar, I'm going on a little long. Um, this is similar to the walking dead in my opinion. Um, where I've also caught up finally with that season's um, fifth season finale. Right. Um, and I believe The Walking Dead is fairly caught up to its source material, isn't it? Uh, no, there's still quite a bit left. Oh, well, sh- there goes my whole argument. Well, <laughs> um, I'll put it this way. When Walking Dead reaches this point, hopefully, well, I don't know how much longer that show ought to be on the air, but um, to me it's like – I think I read at one point they're planned up to like season 10 or so. Oh, my God. No. Yeah. Okay. Well, oh, God. Well, that's a subject. For Maybe another. that's just illusions of grandeur, though. I don't know. Maybe that's just that. That's your fears in front of you. <laughs> yes. Well, I guess for for Game of Thrones, it's good for them to be untethered because then they can do what you probably ought to be able to do anyway when you write a show, which is plan and write a show. You yeah. know, most people who write a show do it without source material, so it's kind of good for you if you've been relying on source material. Maybe to flex that muscle. Um, so that your story can continue to have legs. Yeah. So it'll be interesting because then you'll get less people on the internet who are pissed off because something happened differently from the books. So when there's nothing to compare it to, all of this social media outcry can maybe diminish a little bit. Mm. I'm into the way it's going, um, and uh, I'm I'm more interested in the show now than I ever have been, uh, and I don't think I'm a bad person for watching it or or, or defending it against people who honestly I think are just looking for something to complain about um, yeah. in, in the, you know, socially. Now sure. I know, I know, I believe you agree with me about its place in the social context. I know that you don't watch the show. Mm-hmm. I believe you attempted to watch it, but it was not your thing creatively. I watched, I watched the first season. Um, beyond that, I, I've watched nothing. Mm-hmm. Um, my basic, thesis going off of yours is I'm just tired of hearing about it. Like, right. I, I'm sure like at some point everybody kind of feels this way about shows that they don't watch. But, but for me, game of Thrones still has so much media attention and social media attention that I think it's absolutely ridiculous. And I wish people would just calm down because I couldn't see what was so great about this show. Mm-hmm. I, I can't understand it. To me, it's it's a lesser version of a lot of better things, mm-hmm. and um, and it trades on cheap kills, cheap thrills, and cheap like ways of like manipulating emotions. And for that reason, that's why I think that it's so popular on social media because people can instantly tweet about something that they're emotionally feeling mm-hmm. every single episode. And the fact that that happens every single episode, I think, is lazy storytelling. And storytelling, of course, this is coming from me who has not seen it, who does not know what's going on. Mm-hmm. But I can't imagine being invested in a show where I'm being emotionally manipulated in every single episode. And, um, and especially to a degree that people are it seems after every episode, somebody says, I'm done. I can't. If if that's the show, if that's the impact of the show, then I think that the show is trading on something and in essence sort of overcompensating for its lack of actual development or its lack of actual something. And again, I don't know what that something is because I haven't seen it. But I just – I can't imagine a show or a story where it's constantly – something like that happening. I think most of the reaction to these events is extremely overblown. Like I think that people, I really think that when people freak out about it, it's like you're, I think you're a little too invested in what happens. Like there was, there were videos all over the internet yesterday or the past few days of, you know, angry reactions, like people who filmed themselves watching the end of the episode and like it was all mashed up. And I just thought, this is ridiculous. There's so much of that that it makes me not want to watch the show because I feel like all it is is let's do a thing to make a person feel a thing. That's, and I know I know that's like, kind of what story is. I really is, feel but, like they're not doing that. So that's why I hate people reacting that way so much. It's because I don't feel at all like the show does that. I feel like the show just tells the story. Uh, but I feel like people are assigning – this giant importance to it and this big emotional, I, I, I feel like people, I almost feel like people are reacting just to get attention and I yeah. hate it because clearly like it makes people like you who, I don't, I don't know if you would enjoy the show if you were to watch all the way through, but 
I feel like you would enjoy it more than you think you would. You know, whether it's ultimately worth your time is, you know, that's only you could know that. But I, I hate that, that people are reacting so strongly to it in a way I feel like is disproportionate to what's actually going on. Well, let me let me give you an example. And this is just from the first season. Mm-hmm. Um, I felt like, first of all, I felt very little about that show. So whether I would enjoy it or not, I have no question that I probably wouldn't because I watched a whole season with little to no attachment. Mm-hmm. You know, the death of, of uh, Sean Bean's character, I felt like was a huge emotional like jab at the audience. Um, it's stuff like that. Like, here's what we, th- we're going to make you think a thing and then we're going to pull the rug out from under you. And that's to me, like maybe you can get away with that once to me. It just felt like, Manipulation. It did not feel like, let me tell you a story. It felt like, how can we create a thing that will make people talk at the water cooler? And I know it's based on a, on a book series, so I'm sure that happened in the books. But there again, story to me is an honest, like, I have a burning story in me about people, and I have to get that out. Whether you attach to it or not is not my real concern. My concern is, whether I can tell this story that's burning within me. But to me, the with Game of Thrones, it seems the opposite. It seems it's not so much about the burning story in me. It's about how far can I go to piss off or manipulate the people that are enjoying it. And so for that reason, I don't like it. Also, I felt like uh, there are certain – and I know you have to kind of take these things with a you know, whatever. But, but I felt like there was just a, a negative – complete lack of hope or or positivity in the show i felt and and i know you know the dark ages but still there was no beam of light at all in the show the characters were all morally gray no sense of where am i supposed to be like when i come in and when i attach who is my character who is the one that I'm supposed to be? Because I don't see myself in any of these people. I didn't see anything real in it. I felt like it was all complete fantasy. Mm. There's no way that any of these characters could be what they are. I, I, I didn't see uh, maybe flashes of realism, but but no real grasp of the human condition or the state of the human psyche. Even it was just it was just whatever they were. Here, okay, pot calling the kettle black. When I write, I always feel like my characters are all just me, and and that's my weakness. And that's what has kept me from from really writing more is because I just feel like I've got to get a grasp on writing people that aren't me. But I feel like that's the problem with Game of Thrones is all the characters are the same. They're all cynical. They all are you know selfish. They all – I mean I know it's about all of them wanting the throne, but whatever. It's all just so – they're all the same. None of them have a moral compass. None of them care. It's all weird to me. And in, at least judging from the first season, to me, that didn't make any sense. And, you know, I guess the fact that it's become this critical darling and that everyone is all gaga about it and I couldn't get attached to it made me hate it. And then on top of that, having all of these people being like, it's such a great thing for, you know, feminism and all of the all of these great causes because we've got strong female characters and all this stuff, and yet it still objectifies its women in the way that it does. And all of these things seem so like manipulatory manipula that's not a word, manipulative of the <laughs> audience. Um that it's like, hey, we're going to give you what you want, but there's also people who don't want that, so let me give them that too. There are people who come to the show just to see boobs, and then there are people who come to the show who want equality for women, so let's give them both. But you can't give them both because they're contradictory statements. So anyway, to me, the show just didn't know what it was, and I couldn't attach to it, and it just seemed like everything turned me off. Well, I don't know about the I don't know about the trying to please everybody part of the show. I never got that feeling from it. I know what you mean about the trying to latch onto a character because I guess I'll say this to anyone who, who isn't watching the show. Like it, I think it's an enjoyable show, but you have to realize going in what that season one finale sort of taught me as a viewer was don't get attached to any one of these characters. Um, and for, and for me, it was a shock to my system for a while. Cause I thought, well then, but I was only paying attention to him for the whole season. 
And that's when I sort of shifted the way I approached the show. And I started really trying to pay attention to everyone's story. And it, I guess it enveloped me more into the show and drew me into more of the characters and sort of taught me to think. I guess it made it a little bit more tense, in a good way for for me at least, to think that any of them, no matter what they're trying to do, could be snuffed out. It enhanced it for me because at least it was a little different. But for you, Dustin, then I guess I would I guess I would say you maybe won't want to watch four more seasons of that, you know. Don't. So yeah. that's yeah, I understand I, I understand. You know, and I don't have a problem with ensemble shows, but you know, I do like to at least have a clear voice of who I'm supposed to be rooting for. I can't root for everybody and the show can't tell me you should make up your own mind who to root for. Um, you know, give me a protagonist. And if the answer is root for everybody, then you got to give me reasons to root for everybody. The biggest appeal of the show to, to me is it's a it's basically like watching a gigantic, um, very long uh, game of chess where uh, the pawns, the knights, all those people will actually die. It's, it's just like other shows in, in a way about it's a, just a giant power play between clearly defined characters um, who most of whom are selfish, some of whom you want uh, you want good things for. Like there are characters who don't belong in this world, but must still live in it. So some people you want to see succeed and uh, some of them just uh, suffer. Anyway, yeah, on HBO, HBO Go, um, if you're looking to catch up, I guess I'll add real quick, uh, Silicon Valley season two uh, just wrapped up. This is a show by Mike Judge um, of Office Space. I don't imagine John would like this show because it uh, heavily features TJ Miller. Um, (laughs) But... uh, (laughs) Uh, not much to say about Silicon Valley. It's a good, solid show. Uh, it takes place in, you know, obviously like the tech world. It's basically centered around a group of guys who develop this uh, file compression software that's uh, revolutionary. A bigger company trying to take possession of their intellectual property through a lawsuit. And um, it's basically them navigating the business world. Like what's interesting about this show is it's, it's a show about essentially how business works in a way, but it features colorful char- – it, but it's believable that the characters would be this colorful because they're they're kind of like why Steve Jobs is such an interesting guy because he's a, he's ultra creative, but he's business oriented too. So it's believable mm-hmm. that these kinds of you know wacky characters – I say wacky. They're not cartoonish w- – would be in such a position as they are because these types of people – this is how things like this get started. They, they're smart. They know how to code. They have an idea. And then all of a sudden, they find people who are offering to um, to stake their company, represent them legally, or um, who want to work for them. And they run a company out of a house sort of a thing. So it's interesting in the way of watching a startup kind of grow, um, except it's a comedy. And so there's humor, but there's actual, there's actual obstacles and roadblocks they have to go through. And all the performances are really spot on. I mean, you got Martin Starr. Um, what's, his, what's his face? Kamel Nanjani. Uh, TJ Miller. Um uh, that guy who played Gabe on The Office, I can't remember his freaking name. Um, uh, yeah, I can't remember. But that guy—it's it's like Josh something, I think. Um, yeah. But uh, he's funny, and um, and the main character Thomas Middleditch, who I didn't know anything about, and I was sort of annoyed yeah, by his funny. character, like for a while because he's such a puss. Mm-hmm. Like he's like, um, you know, I guess uh, Pied Piper uh, can be the. Uh, uh, I hate this guy, but then I guess it took me seeing an interview with him where he's mm-hmm. he's completely the opposite of that guy Dude, of the Richard so character. He's hilarious, yeah. and and I guess the point of the show is watching him become more assertive and um, more confident. As you know, if he's going to be the CEO of this company, he can't be this buttoned up, bottled up kind of a uh, nervous, neurotic dude. So I think it's a fun show to watch. And it's half hour. It's comedy. It's good stuff. Check out Silicon Valley um, if you're looking for something to latch onto. It's a uh, it's very solid show and uh, i'm excited to see more of it nice we're going to talk about jurassic world um it has over the weekend become what the highest grossing domestic um opening weekend of all time time. yep wow half a billion half a billion dollars um that's impressive that's that's very impressive um if you had asked me at the beginning of this year i would never in a million years have thought that uh, John and Dustin both saw the film. I did not. Um, so we're going to play John's uh, review of it real quick. And then uh, Dustin's got some stuff to say as well. Um, and maybe I will, but I didn't see it. So I don't imagine I have a lot to say. Anyway, um, here's John with his uh, his thoughts on Jurassic World. All right. 
So here are my quick thoughts on Jurassic World. The first Jurassic Park is one of my favorite movies of all time. And so I think I obviously had high expectations for this film, this follow-up film to that first movie. The film is really a sequel to the first film and largely kind of ignores the second and third film, which kind of received mixed reactions from a lot of people. I think that this was a smart way to go, obviously, because the first film is the, the best loved of the whole franchise. But I think a lot of people went into this hoping it would be as good as the first film. I never had that impression. I knew that there was no way it could be as good as the first film uh, because the scope of film has changed so much and the way films are made and, and stories are told has changed radically in the in the decades since the first film has been released so i knew it would be different and it is quite different um it's more of an action adventure type film while the first one was kind of a more serious science fiction film with with some slight action and and horror elements to it um but this was kind of a straight action movie with some science thrown in that being said i think they did a really good job of breathing new life into the brand and the franchise while still maintaining a lot of the old vibes from the first film. So you're going to have a lot of callbacks to the first film, a lot of Easter eggs and references to the first film. They kind of bring up a lot of emotions within you and kind of help it to relate to the first film. The Easter eggs aren't beating you over the head though. They're, they're pretty subtle and you have to know the first film pretty well to get a lot of them, although casual viewers will, will notice a lot of them as well. But I, I think it, it went in a, in a more action-oriented way, including heavy use of CG, which was another thing that some people have, have talked about negatively, the film's over-reliance on CG. Because the first film was kind of a watershed film in terms of visual effects, both with audio-animatronic figures and uh, early CG characters, um, it's been kind of held up to this untouchable. It's it's a very respected film in that regard uh, for special effects, and so a lot of people were disappointed uh, that they went with CG in this film. I thought the CG was good. It didn't blow me away, but but it was never distracting or or bad. I thought um, there there was one or two scenes an, an animatronic figure was used, but for the most part, I'd say. 85% of the uh, visual effects are done with CG in this film. But I didn't mind it. I, I, I think they were done well, and and uh, they didn't take away from the film at all for me. The, the big strength of the film for me was just the fact that it brought that world back to life. I think we'd all been waiting to see how this film turned out because we care so much about the world. And, and this was really the first film to show what that park would be like if it actually opened to guests which is something we'd all been wondering since the first film, um, which got close, uh, but, but the park never actually had guests in it. So this is kind of exploring what would happen if, if a catastrophe uh, were to occur within the park. It also deals with scientists creating a new breed of dinosaur by uh, picking and pulling different parts and pieces from various other dinosaurs within the park, um, basically kind of creating this monster dinosaur. Um, I think that's an interesting concept to explore, if if not hugely realistic. Um, but I think you have to kind of look at this film as not as realistic as the first one and just kind of go with it. So once you put that behind you, I think you can look at the Indominus Rex as a very interesting aspect of the film. And another high point for the film for me were the two leads, uh, Chris Pratt and Bryce Dallas Howard. Uh, Chris Pratt plays a kind of uh, dinosaur trainer and, and kind of assumes uh, kind of a mixture of roles from the first film, Alan Grant and uh, Dr. Ian Malcolm. He, he's kind of a, a mixture of both those characters. So he's, he's a little bit of a quiet character. He's a little rugged, uh, but he also has a lot of apprehensions about the park and how uh, all these uh, crossbred dinosaurs and all that can fit into the entire world. Um, Chris Pratt was good. I don't think that any of the characters in this film were quite as memorable or even close to as memorable as the ones in the first film. But that was never, like I said, that had never in even entered my mind that they, they would be that. So 
Uh, it didn't bother me. They were actually better developed than I thought they would be. Bryce Dallas Howard does a good job uh, kind of playing a um, career-driven, career-obsessed woman who is in charge of park operations. And she's kind of uh, put in the middle of this whole incident while looking for her two nephews that are there visiting the park. Um, so she joins up with Chris Pratt's character to search through the park and find them after they go missing. So it's kind of similar to the first film in that way. Two groups of people trying to reconnect with one another like the first film. And overall, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was fun. Um, don't go into it expecting some deep message like the first film had. This is not the first film. Uh, this is kind of Jurassic Park for an entirely new audience and an entirely new generation while still maintaining a lot of the DNA Oh, they made the first film great. So if that sounds appealing to you, go check it out because I would recommend it. Thanks. There are dinosaurs in the, in the Hoopercast studio. Oh, in the studios. Oh, I got to go. Oh, God. All right. When you got to go, you got to go. Okay, let's let's keep going. Okay. Um, <laughs> all right, anyway, those are John's uh that's John. So uh Dustin, do you yeah. have anything to add to uh to that? Basically, I agree with him. I mean, it's a fun movie and it's something that that I definitely enjoyed. Um I didn't realize how big of a Jurassic Park kind of nerd I am until I saw the movie and the score came on like in the theater and I was like, oh my gosh, like waves of nostalgia over here. I'll set this up too. I, I'm one of those people, I don't really like The Lost World very much, but I don't mind so much Jurassic Park 3. I mean, it's goofy. It's got the talking raptor and it has Alan or whatever talking at the end. Alan. Like, <laughs> yeah, as Dr. Grant talking at the end with the uh, uh, with the Velociraptor like larynx or whatever it was, I don't know, and he talks to raptors, which is super goofy. But but I don't mind it so much. I think it's okay. I mean, whatever. Uh, and then Jurassic World comes around, and like John said, it's it's a more of a direct sequel to uh, the first film because it's set on that same island, whereas The Lost World and Jurassic Park 3 are both set on the sister island. This, we're back in the original island with the original dinosaurs, and, um, yeah, I mean, look, it's it's a fun movie, and um, I've, I've heard it criticized for a lot of things, and John and I were talking um, earlier uh, about just the various things that it's criticized for and how the internet bloggers kind of go crazy and just want something to pick on. The thing that we're seeing the most criticism about the movie for is is that Bryce Dallas Howard ran in heels, and <laughs> that's that a step back for feminism. And I'm oh, like, for God's and I'm sake, like, I'm so I'm, tired of hearing that. Me too. I'm like, first of all, n- movies are expressions of self, and if the writer doesn't want to express feminism, you cannot fault him for not having your vision. Do you know what's a step back for feminism? Film criticism. Always bringing up feminism. Yeah, this in is In every true. context possible. Well, feminism, f- feminism, especially in movie criticism, doesn't take into account that women are different. That every woman is different from every other woman. So who's to say that having a woman who runs in heels or who, you know, falls in love with Chris Pratt or whatever, who's to say that that's not realistic? Or who's to say that that's a step back for feminism? Women are different from women. You look at Firefly, Zoe is not, is not River, is not Kaylee, is not Inara. Women are just different. Characters should be different. You can't have every woman be like a a stone-faced, you know, I don't need no man, tough as nails character. That works for Ellen Ripley and it works for the Terminator. But but it's the same as if you wrote every man the same. Exactly. Like we don't want to see any characters who really remind us of other characters. And exactly. just because she's a woman doesn't mean she has to be ultra diff. Like oh, it, I, I just yeah. I feel like they're crying wolf at this point. So every time it's they're like, like, it's like "Hey, the feminism," who- I'm like, "Hey, I don't hear you. You say this all. You say this every day. You know, mm-hmm. I'm not gonna. I, there's a wolf in the woods. No, I don't. I don't believe you. 
I don't believe you anymore. Yeah, it's the same. It's the same as the people who got all over Joss Whedon for having Black Widow in a relationship and talk about you know being sad for being you know infertile and whatnot. And I'm like, who? Like that, <laughs> that's not a step back for feminism. That is a character who is different from other female characters. It shows that women are individuals. I don't yeah. understand. Yeah. Um, I, oh, fuck. Anyway, okay, enough <laughs> about that. Anyway, there's a lot being said about this film that is not valid film criticism. So yeah, let's talk about it, right. this. John made a good point that blockbusters in, in the decades since the original Jurassic Park have changed. Like it or not, blockbusters have changed. So when I went into this, I was not expecting a 1990s blockbuster because that's not what I was going to get. What I was expecting was an action movie that had dinosaurs in it, had Chris Pratt in it, and I got those things. So so I wasn't disappointed. And I've heard people say it's not tense. It doesn't have any frightening parts, but... Oh my God. Did, Did they enjoy the film or not? Exactly. Like, the film has a few missteps. I'm not going to say it doesn't. There are things that they bring up and then drop. There are things that uh, you would think relate to characters that don't really matter so much. And that's about as vague as I can be, you know, without spoiling specific things. Mm -hmm. Um, Well, I'll give you one example. So the first time that we see these two children characters, one of them, a 16-year-old, is saying goodbye to his girlfriend. And then next time you see him, he's like, you know, at the airport or something, and he's like looking at pictures of her on his phone. Hey, that girlfriend, so, she she's not defined by being his boyfriend, you know. She's she, do you remember her name, Ooh. Dustin, or is she just his? Is that all she is to you? Is his girlfriend? They literally never said her name. <laughs> um, so, but anyway, he's like looking at pictures of her on his phone. So you think maybe the through line for him is going to be related to his girlfriend? Then all of a sudden, it's gone. Like it never comes back again. So maybe you know what they thought they were doing was giving character and saying here's a 16 year old boy you know he's your typical 16 year old boy he has this girlfriend who's obsessed with but he's not really you know all that committed to her or whatever you know Mm -hmm. they thought they were saying things but but what it felt like was they were setting up a story rather than just a character point does that make sense a character trait yeah um so there there are problems in that regard and there are things that i certainly would have done differently but you know there again it's hard to fault a film or criticize a film for something that they didn't do well i'm going to continue to say what i would continue to point i've not seen the film Mm -hmm. but i'm starting i've I've demonstrated this is the third time now i'm going to mention this with stuff we've talked about recently so I'll, i'll keep i'll keep the point itself short I'm just noticing that anytime we're rebooting or bringing something um, back into the public eye, like mm. uh, Daredevil or this, you know, mm-hmm. I think what they're trying to do, reestablishing these franchises, is, or oh, Mad Max was the other thing, is mm. I think what they're trying to do is just bring it up and rebrand it and not yeah. try to juggle too much in the first film. I sure. think I don't think they thought they'd break, you know, the record they broke, but mm. I think they just hoped, look, let's just make a solid movie. And then if it does well, we can really try to we can really try to make a great movie with the next one. That's arguably smarter than trying than going balls out on the first one, and then and then having right. nothing to follow up with. It's true, and 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 to be fair, I mean, in hindsight, what is it that that you really want out of a Jurassic Park sequel? Like, I want if to see I some dinosaur asked, chases. Yeah, if I had asked anybody. You know, two weeks ago, what do you want out of this? They're going to say, I want to see some cool dinosaur action. No one's going to say, I, well, I hope the characters are relatable and believable, and I hope that they have a solid arc that gets, you know, tied up emotionally at the end. Do you know no what's the ultimate relatability? Mm. Danger. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and this film has that. The thing about Jurassic Park, it's one of my favorite movies of all time, but when you go back and you watch it, the characters are not nearly as fleshed out as you remember them being. Right. You think they're, you're starry-eyed they're, about them. Well, this is true, but but the the characters like essentially are hinted throughout the film. Like you get to know the characters through their actions and the way they respond to the danger. There's not like a big build up of like 30 minutes of Dr. Grant so you get to know him before he gets on the island. You know, you meet him at the 
at the dig site and he t- talks to a kid in a frightening way. And then, so you know two things about him. One, he loves his work. He's passionate about it. And two, he doesn't like kids. <laughs> Those are the two things you learn about him. And then the next time you see him, he is on the island. You see what I'm saying? He's yeah. he's on the way to the island. So you learn more about him as the story goes along, about the way that he responds to situations. And it's the same way here. There's not a huge setup for who Chris Pratt is, but you learn who he is through his, you know, through his reaction actions. to the things. Um, now, here's the thing. Do we know what Chris Pratt does when he's not on the island? Not really. Do we know what his passions are if he ever, you know, was married or, you know, if his parents are still alive? No. But we didn't know those things about Alan Grant either. So to me, you know, how much character do you want in this film? Because ultimately it is not about the people. It is about the way they react to the environment they're in, which is a super dangerous, you're about to die all the time environment. Mm-hmm. Um, and, I, and I believe that we do learn enough about these characters to root for them. Now, it is not enough to then make the Chris Pratt spinoff without the dinosaurs, but I don't want that. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. Um, and you're not going to win an Oscar because it's not a it's not a role that's going to like change lives or make you think. But it's a it's a role that gives you enough about that character to root for him, and that's all you need in a that, movie like yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. People overblow like uh, you know like I I hate the we talk about this all the time, but like mm. I, we, I don't I hate the people just are in this big thing where like somewhere they've been taught that they've sold out if they even enjoy a blockbuster movies or, yeah, exactly. you know, if they if they cannot defend something intellectually, then it, it, it shall not be enjoyed. Right. And exactly. I, I, I hate that with any, that's, that, that's not criticism. That's actually like, that's more exclusive than mm-hmm. having no female characters or something to me. It's like, you're right. dismissing the film because it's it's made for a, a large audience. Sure. Or or in the case of this film, it is made in a way that kids can also enjoy it. Yeah, um, I, I, whereas whereas the first Jurassic Park is probably more of an adult movie than this is. But who cares? Let's compare the Great Train Robbery with Jurassic Park. Okay. Um, which one would you rather watch, Dustin? I would rather watch Jurassic Park. Oh, boy. Oh, I'm gonna take your uh, I'm gonna take your degree right now and just rip it up for saying that. Oh no! Yeah, I mean Why it's just, it's, it's, it's boring. Like, I mean, it may be it may be cinema history, but it's uh, the fact is it's boring. It is. I'm sorry. Sure. So all I'm saying is that's boring. That's true. I'm mm-hmm. not dismissing its value as as a piece of cinema history or yeah. or or bringing or pushing the medium forward as it did. Mm-hmm. So conversely, if you're a movie snob, you cannot dismiss Jurassic World. Because it's made for a broad audience, and you can probably dismiss it in terms of uh, its creative content. I don't, you know what I'm trying to say? Like you could dismiss sure, it. I do. But, but to a certain extent, it's like, but, it's, but think about why it was made and what it was made to do. And mm. your answer might be, oh, consumerism and blah, blah, blah. You know? But mm-hmm. for God's sake, like, can't we just make an action-adventure movie anymore? Right. And, and, and here's, here's the other thing I'll say about the characters in the film is – that uh, you have to – let's – again, we're going to compare them to the original Jurassic Park. Jurassic Park, what was Dr. Grant's goal through the film? It was to live. It was to survive. It was to make it another minute you mm-hmm. know, in this you know, tropical craziness. But what made it feel deeper was that he overcame his hatred of children. This was not a goal that he had. He didn't enter the movie saying, you know, I need to be better with kids. It was a byproduct (laughs) of spending time with them. So his goal was still survival. Yeah. But it feels deeper because a secondary thing happened. I hate to spoil this for you, Hooper. It's dumb. But in Jurassic World, what is Chris Pratt's goal? Survival. Mm -hmm. What happens as a byproduct of the survival? He gets Uh, to kiss Bryce Dallas Howard. Mm-hmm. But the feminists would have you say this is not a good thing because it's like, oh, oh, whatever. A, a I don't, man is happy? I don't know. <laughs> but but here's the other thing. Um, she's work obsessed um, and, okay. um, and over the course of it b- begins to feel some feelings for Chris Pratt. 
Um, they may be based on the fact that you know they're in this together, or they may not be. Who knows? The point is, there is a byproduct of Chris Pratt's goal in the film, which is survival, just like Alan Grant's. It may not seem as deep, but it's every bit as deep. Because why did Dr. Grant get over his hatred of children? Because he spent time with them. Why did Chris Pratt sort of maybe fall in love with Bryce Dallas Howard? Because he spent time with her. That was the thing. It's exactly the same thing. So why is this character so much more thin than Alan Grant? He's not really. It's just the fact that people like to hate on him because he's the action hero, and Alan Grant was a reluctant hero. Mm -hmm. That's the difference. So it's a personal preference thing. It's not a matter of whether one character was more thin or less thin than the other. They were the same. Someone saying the characters are too thin, they don't have an argument. It's just not something I think about when I watch these movies. Like, and, right. I'm not, and I'm not tricked into not thinking about it. It's just, mm. that's not why I'm here. Like, no. I'm, I, I, I'd rather the underlying story be relatively simple because there's nothing worse in certain movies where, like, you know, where they put too much emphasis on the part you don't care about. Like, look the, at, the, look the, at the Godzilla. Problems with transform- okay, well, or Godzilla. The pro- well, here, you do Godzilla, but I'm going to do Transformers. Okay, go do Transformers. Okay, well, in Transformers, um, they spend way too much time with the human characters. I don't really yeah. care about them. I don't care, I don't care too much about, about the setup of Sam going to college and blah, blah, blah. Like, you got to have some of that because you have to latch onto somebody, perhaps. Sure. To me, like, all I wanted to do was watch the robots fight in those movies. And, yeah. I, I, you know, so when they made. The, the sequels that had more robots fighting, I was uh, I was into that, you know, mm. like that. It's and it's I, who cares if they're fleshed out completely? That's not why I'm here. To me, to me, the Jurassic World is the opposite of Godzilla because Godzilla was afraid to give us what we wanted, which mm-hmm. was Godzilla. Yeah, and instead worked too hard at trying to flesh out characters that we never cared about in the first place. Yes, Jurassic World is the opposite. It gives us exactly what we want, which is dinosaurs. And dinosaurs fighting and dinosaurs being scary and dinosaurs being legit and awesome (laughs) and cuts down the time that we spend with the characters. Maybe, maybe it didn't feel like, oh, I don't, we never spend any time with the characters. We do. So, but it cuts down on like the, the boring, like stuff that you're going to say, ah, stop, you know? So I don't know. I think this is the the answer to Godzilla. This is better than that Godzilla film was. It was fun to watch. It gave us what we wanted. It didn't spend time giving us what we don't want. And and like you said, it or like John said, it sets up and reintroduces this world for future films and for the new generation in a way that I think they needed it set up to be. An eight-year-old kid today is different from an eight-year-old kid in the 90s, and what they desire out of a blockbuster is different because what they're getting from blockbusters is different. So, I mean, I don't know about you, Hooper, but when I was eight years old, I don't think my mom wanted me to see Jurassic Park. I remember the first time I saw Jurassic Park, though, I was at my grandfather's house, and he put it on TV. It was on VHS that he had bought. And I don't remember my mom being very happy that I was watching Jurassic Park because I was too young. And I don't know how old I was, probably like five or six or so. It was more of an adult movie, whereas over the years, because maybe kids have become desensitized or whatever it may be, Jurassic Park is viewed more as more childish these days and kids love the dinosaurs and love all that stuff maybe it's because Jurassic Park 3 was more childish I don't know this takes that a step further and makes this franchise for kids and adults alike and I don't have a problem with that because it didn't sacrifice to me the tension it didn't sacrifice the the dinosaur thrills it didn't sacrifice what I came to see so I don't mind I know what I've said is a lot of positive stuff there are some negative things too but but by and large, the movie's fun, and if you are in the mood to see dinosaurs fight, and if you like Jurassic Park, you're going to like this movie. I, I, I really – well, maybe not. I think I've been proven wrong just by saying that. But <laughs> but, but I think that Jurassic Park and Jurassic World are – I compared them earlier to Alien and Aliens. If Alien is the more um, – like horror driven film, mm-hmm. aliens being the more action driven film, that's the same way here. But I like both approaches. And I think both approaches are valid with the subject matter. So who cares? I don't I, whatever. Yeah. Long story short, if you like Jurassic Park, at least give this a shot. Maybe you'll like it, maybe you won't, 
But if you like action movies, give it a shot. If you're super into dinosaurs, give it a shot. You don't have anything to lose, but don't go into it expecting it to be Jurassic Park because it isn't. It's its own thing, and it should be its own thing. You should go so, into every film with a clean slate. Exactly. You should at least try to go in without any presuppositions, and and that I, I believe that for everything. I, like it's almost like people go into movies ready to take mental notes about its yeah. structure. It's like, look, I'm not saying you should turn off your brain and just be like a sheep, you know, at the no. theater. But I mean, if but you're go, try are you going to the it. movie? Are you going to the movie to rip it apart, or are you going there to enjoy it? Because if you're there to enjoy it, then just relax and watch the movie. I'm right. there for an escape. I don't see dinosaurs in my everyday life, so I expect to see some. I, I don't want to see a bunch of human drama that I encounter every day when I go to the theater. I want to see some dinosaurs. I want to see, you know, I want to see big robots fight. I, I, I that that's just me. But I think I think you'll like this movie, Connor. Yeah, and and I think I think that most people will. And I think five hundred million dollars proves my point. Yeah, you know there are some problems if you look at it from a critical artistic point of view there are some problems but they're so small that it doesn't harm the overall good that the that the movie does right. and uh and that good being fun and that good being you know escapism and that yes. fun being just general awesome dinosaur stuff yeah stop overthinking it yeah you know um, would it would it be great if this had a philosophical social message like the first one that said, you know, you were so busy thinking about if you could, you didn't wonder if you should? Yeah, I mean, I guess so. But in a way, it kind of does, even though it doesn't verbalize it. Because they reopen the park. That That's the embodiment of this. You didn't think about if you should. Um, so they don't verbalize it this time around. But, you know, whatever. Who cares? I don't know. I don't even know what I'm saying anymore. Basically, <laughs> the point is Jurassic Park or Jurassic World is a is a good film. And and while it's not going to win any Oscars, it, it it's going to be a good jumping on point for new people, for kids, for this new generation and a re-jumping on point for people who have forgotten the franchise after maybe two films that, that weren't so great. And I will I will put it here. I like Jurassic Park the best, Jurassic World the second best, Jurassic Park three, and the Lost World at the bottom. Just because the Lost World has a girl gymnastic kicking Velociraptors, oh, yeah. there's none of that here. No no, no gymnastics in this film. So, um, although a woman does run in her heels, so if you have a problem with mm-hmm. women wearing heels because women shouldn't be wearing heels or something, I don't know. Uh, you know. Okay, well, that's going to be it for uh, this week. Um, we would talk about what's in theaters next week, but the only thing I see opening is Inside Out, which is the yeah, new man. Pixar one, right? Yes, I will be seeing that. Okay, I don't know anything about it, but uh, I'm sure we will talk about it uh, fairly soon. I've never seen a trailer for it, but it says Pixar, oh. so I'll see it. Okay, good. That's probably – oh, I'm interested then with a clean slate. I won't watch yeah, any I've trailers because I'd like you to uh, to describe it to me fresh when you see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know – very quickly for me, it was just a matter of it's a Pixar movie. I'd like to see it, yeah. but you know, it's not like a like an Avengers where oh, I want to just I, let me get a glimpse. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I'm just like, oh, I don't have you, to see you, a you trust their batting average. Sure. So. Yeah. There you go. Okay. Well, uh, thanks for listening, you guys. Um, subscribe to us on iTunes or um, or on uh, YouTube, Hoopercast Pod. Or on blogger, hoopercastpod.blogspot.com, or Tumblr, hoopercastpod.tumblr.com. You can donate on both of those two websites, or the Facebook page, facebook.com slash hoopercast, or uh, on Podbean, hoopercastpod.podbean.com, and follow us on Twitter at hoopercast. Don't follow us in real life because I will call the police and you will be searched and detained. Uh, until next time, uh, I'm Connor, that's Dustin. This was the hoop. This and we have been the Hoopercast. We have been the Hoopercast. Don't they talk? Don't they teach like the Apple employees to say that or something? Like I've been Kevin or something. It's something like that. Or was that just from the Winter Soldier? I'm thinking of. I know that was from Winter Soldier, but I don't know. I've I've only been to an Apple store once. Sorry, Apple. Yeah, we don't have one in um, the city I live in. Yeah, the closest one to me is like an hour away. So yeah, mine's in I'm New not, Orleans. I'm not going up there. Yeah. All right. All right, everybody. Goodbye. All right. Bye. Woo. Up.